I was recently asked to talk uh, about Web2 and the enterprise, but I like to put a little different spin on things. So I'm actually going to talk about this from a perspective that I've been using lately. Uh, I've been giving a talk called Web Meets World, and we're talking about it from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, first off at O'Reilly, we tend to look at people who are sort of experimenting at the edges, and they start to tell us something about the shape of the future. And I've been noticing that a lot more people are starting to deal with physical stuff again. Developers building applications that rely on sensors. And this led me to, to think about where Web 2.0 was going. And one of the conclusions that I came to was that the next stage of Web 2.0 is going to be driven by sensors and ambient computing. Ambient computing meaning computing that we encounter away from our desk, you know, in the environment, uh, with devices that we carry around uh, with us. And I really believe that we are moving out of the world in which people typing on keyboards are going to be driving the collective intelligence applications that make up Web 2.0. You know, increasingly, these applications are driven by sensors. And I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples, and I'm going to tell you why I think this is really the heart of uh, Web 2.0 and the enterprise. Now, this is actually something that came up just the other day. Uh, some college students wired the laundry room of their college so that the dryers and the washers twittered their availability. Now this is, uh, it harkens back to the early days of the internet when, or the World Wide Web, when and sort of the you know, uh, coffee pot webcams and the like were, were out there. Uh, this is always an early stage thing. But you know, just think about that. What about when your devices start twittering their status? You know, and it's available anywhere on the net. And also think about uh, the following the recent hurricanes. There were sites uh, like Storm Pulse that let you follow the track, you know, the satellite imagery available to everyone. It wasn't just something you watched on television. You could tune in. You know, we're instrumenting the world. Uh, and of course, hackers are out there on the front edge. A group uh, put together a project called the Quake Capture Network. Uh, this, they realized that every Mac uh, has a motion sensor in it. And gosh, if people would only run a distributed uh, program, they could report changes to uh, sudden preservations in the forest, so to speak. They could uh, detect earthquakes. They built a, a large distributed uh, uh, you know, earthquake sensing uh, uh, mechanism. So if you like that and you have a map, download the software. You too can be uh, an earth sensing uh, contributor. Katie London over at NYU was actually a star in night the other night. I did a project. Uh, uh, is it last year or the year before, um, called Botanic Calls. Uh, this uses Asterisk, uh, the open source uh, uh, voice over IP telephony uh, server, so that your plants can call your cell phone when they're thirsty. Sensors, uh, you know, detecting the, the ground conditions. They, I believe it actually also now works with Twitter. Uh, so your plants are being instrumented. Um, if you look at uh, what's happening with the whole competition to make mapping 3D. We're really seeing a change. Every camera is becoming a sensor. With tools like Photosynth, 3D models are being built uh, from collections of, of your photos. Uh, or they're being, you know, Google and Microsoft are out driving the streets building collections of photos. And this is really changing the way even designers are thinking about stuff. I had a conversation recently with Carl Bass, the CEO of Autodesk, and Carl was describing to me how the, the Autodesk workflow is starting to look a lot like the workflow of a, uh, a, a rap star, right? They start, they start sampling. That's the first thing they do. They don't sit down at the desk and uh, start designing from scratch. They sample the world, whether it's with photographs or with 3D scanners, and then they start modifying. All right, so we also see this instrumentation of the world in our phone, applications like World, which I believe is from a company here in New York, I don't know if you're about that. Yep. Uh, helping build the social network on your phone by detecting the people who are nearby. Uh, Brady Forrest, uh, you know, our program chair here, did a radar post recently though, about how this could go further. Apple could do more with what they have uh, in the way of location sensing on the phone. Location sensing is going to be one of the fundamental system services of, of Web 2.0. But you know, when you think about turning 1.0 into 2.0, there's a great enterprise example that I look at, and that is the phone company. You know, and, and you start thinking, why is the phone company different from Google? Right? They both have massive data centers. 
That data is from their customers. This customer contribution potentially, and the data gets better all the time. The services are sold uh, as a service, is not as a product. Right? Uh, this data mining of customer behavior, the difference is that the real-time services that the phone offers, uh, they're not really exploring all the possibilities. You, know, you think about that location data in the phone, it's not really being exposed. Or you think about your address book in your phone, you don't get to annotate it, they give you the last 10 calls out of your uh, you know, or some limited number, whereas they have a record going all the way back. They could have turned that inside out. And so when people talk about Web 2.0 in the enterprise, they'll often focus on social media, so Dell Idea Storm. You know, let's get the users um, putting us uh, you know, in touch with uh, uh, new ideas. But Dell actually had a Web 2.0 route long before they did something like Idea Storm. If you think about how Dell works, their original breakthrough was an integrated supply chain where they were sensing from their users right at the outset. You know, people would say, gosh, you know, they're buying more 20-inch monitors right now. So that feedback would go right back down the line to the factories and they'd make more of them. That's very much like the way that Google is autonomic. It learns automatically from what its users are doing. The results are continually updated by computers without human intervention. And that's where the big opportunity is for the enterprise, I think. It is, in fact, to take your systems, to take systems that are collecting data from your customers, and to start to think of those as user contribution systems. Now, in fact, Enterprise 2.0 to me means letting users into your back office. Now, don't analyze that data. Literally build systems so that the front end responds to that. Right? Make that information available to developers so they can participate with you in building against your data. This Web 2.0 is fundamentally a data operating system. And the data that is locked up inside corporations is one of the greatest assets. And a huge amount of that data is, in fact, user-contributed data. Because, of course, businesses have customers. The customers have interaction. That is data. That is the fundamental realization of Web 2.0. And for Web 2.0 to move to the enterprise, we need to take that sensing aspect, the sense in which a business is interacting with the world, and take that data and then feed it back out. Feed it back out. And or else, you can wait if you're a big company and some innovative startup will, will do it for you. And uh, you know, maybe put you out of business in the process. Uh, and certainly, if you're, you are a startup, I would really urge you to, to think about the potential of going into to markets with real products and real value. And not, don't just think about the consumer internet. Think about how to apply Web 2.0 principles to the way the world really works. But there's another sense in which I want to talk about web meets world, and it's very relevant to today's news, or actually this is a couple of days ago, news has gotten worse. I thought this was a great cover from the New York Times because it had two disasters on it. You know, the, the, the financial meltdown, uh, the ongoing news of, of the hurricane in Galveston. You know, pretty depressing times in a lot of ways. And you have to conclude, when you look at the focus of a lot of what's been called Web 2.0, you know, the, 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 the relentless focus on advertising-based consumer and business models, lightweight applications, you know, we may be living in something of a bubble. And I don't mean the investment bubble, I mean a reality bubble. When there are financial crises, when we have the worst income inequality since the Gilded Age, right? We have oil price shocks, we have global warming, we have decline in science, literacy, and education, there's water scarcity looming, there's exotic diseases cropping up, right? We have aging populations, soaring health care costs, we have a decline in U.S. economic competitive, we've got a dysfunctional political system, right? And what are our best and brightest working on? <laughs> Applications. I mean, come on, this is, is fun, it's cool. All right? But you have to ask yourself, are we working on the right things? Now, it's tough to predict the future. We've been in this wonderful period of expansion in the market, and it's been fun, it's been great. In fact, it's led people like Ray Kurzweil to say, the singularity is near. You know, we're all going to be uploaded into our computers. It's literally going to be a transformation of humanity as we become, you know, super intelligent through, you know, connecting more deeply with our machines. Of course, there's the other side. It's a wonderful 
book by one of our keynote speakers at our O'Reilly's Money Tech conference last year called The Demon of Our Own Design, about the, the risks that were inherent in program trading and, and what hedge funds were doing. You know, that we'd actually built a machine that we no longer controlled, that was out of control. Well, it looks like maybe books stay were maybe more on the money than Kurzweil, at least at the moment, as we see, uh, you know, headlines like, like this one, where Wall Street fears the next Great Depression. So, which of these is it going to be? You know? Uh, we don't know. But there's a, there's a science in business called scenario planning. And a lot of times when people think about different scenarios, they build charts that look like this. This is one of the kind of uh, early examples that, that led to the scenario planning industry, which came out of the oil you know, industry. And of course, you probably have scenarios like this for your business. Our growth rate will be 5% or it'll be 20% or it'll be 30%, whatever. And you have this nice, you know, the worst case isn't, isn't so bad. Well, this is what actually uh, uh, was the forecast for an oil uh, drilling uh, equipment company uh, back in 1980. Here's what really happened. And the reason it happened was something that they didn't anticipate at all. It turned out that a lot of the demand for oil drilling at that time was driven by investment partnerships with money flowing from doctors and lawyers and other professionals. And Congress changed the law that gave favorable tax treatment to those kinds of partnerships. And bang, the market fell apart. Right? So, you know, you can build your business on a house of cards and have things change radically. Of course, it can go the other way too. Here's the original forecast for the IBM PC from IBM. They thought when they released it in 1981 that that device would have a lifetime of about maybe 240,000 units. So they were wrong on the downside. The scenario planning, what they try to do is to figure out some really extreme cases. I mean, let's take the singularity as one poll. Let's take, you know, global economic and environmental collapse as the other. Let's take on another axis. Let's say, hey, China's going to take over the, the, you know, the economic and technological leadership of the world. Uh, on another poll, we'll say the U.S. leads. And then you ask yourself, what scenarios, I mean, what strategies are robust in the face of any of those possibilities. That is, what things should you be doing regardless that you won't regret, right? And, and use that as an exercise. And I want to just offer to you, in the face of you know, the challenges that we're seeing today, that one of the most robust strategies is to work on stuff that matters, right? Because if you're trying to ride a wave, you're just going, wow, you know, there's a lot of money pouring into you know, this particular uh, trend, and I want, to, I want to catch some of it. You could just as easily be caught out. But if you're working on something that you really, really care about, or that really, really has to be done, you don't care whether it's, you're not doing it because you think you can maybe catch a little bit of that great money river in your cup. You're doing it because you love it, right? But maybe you, it's, you know, and I think we've heard some other speakers saying you gotta, you know, just do what you love and are passionate about. I wanna say more than that. Do stuff that needs to be done. There's this great quote from a guy named Irving Yalom. He said, first will what is necessary, and then love what you will. And we may be coming into a time when we have to work on things that we don't love, we don't necessarily want to do, but we have to do. And we need to learn to love those things and give them our passion. And there's a real, another key piece to this, which is a saying that we use at O'Reilly, create more value than you capture. You know, if you look at what went wrong on Wall Street, this is an industry that, you know, at its heart, creates a lot of value. You know, liquidity in markets is, is critical, right? But if you look at the last, you know, decade, uh, there's been more and more of this attitude, of, let's take more out of the system than we put back in. They've lost the ecological systems thinking that says we have to make the whole system survive and thrive. And I think clearly, these Wall Street firms captured a whole lot more value than they were creating. And now, of course, the, the problems are coming home to roost. This leads me kind of to a, uh, a concept uh, from the famous mathematician Blaise Pascal. Back in the uh, 17th century, he proposed something called Pascal's Wager, which was about religion and whether you should believe in God or not. And his argument was, if you believe in God, you're going to live a good life, you're going to uh, try to be virtuous, and if there is no God, well, guess what? You've lived a good life. 
So it's better to act as though there's a God, even though you don't really know the answer. We have a new version of Pascal's wager today, I think. We have to assume the worst. We have to assume this world is going to hell in a handbasket unless we do something about it. There's a lot of people who look at the world's problems and say, oh, it'll work out. Well, it will work out if we make a difference, if we work on stuff that matters, if we create more value than we capture. And that's really what I want to challenge you guys to do. You know, business is, you know, the engine of innovation. You know, I, I really believe in markets and I believe in the power that we all have to build great companies that change things. And I want to just give you a couple of examples. Let's take global warming. Um, some of you may say, oh, I don't really believe that stuff out of you know, Al Gore's and Bag, and well, let's not worry about it. Um, but there's a version of Pascal's Wager. You can look at these slides, by the way, are from a guy named Kevin Sirachi, who runs a, 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 a clean tech company called Serious Materials. By the way, material science, fascinating area. Um, they try to make green, green materials. Uh, the International Panel on Climate Change has sort of this gradual model. There's a lot of doomsayers who say, wow, you know, there could be real discontinuous climate change. It could be really, really destructive. Oh, who's right? And we don't really know. But let's just sort of look at these sort of a Pascal's wager kind of question. Okay, let's assume there's no climate change. Well, we invest money in new technology. We, we, we make some new things. We reduce our dependence on oil. We don't do anything. Life goes on. Right now, look a little like that may not be the most likely outcome. Uh, you know, if there is climate change and we make these investments, we act, you know, we've saved billions of lives, we invent this new technology, we reduce our reliance on oil. And of course, if we don't act, and there is climate change is a serious problem, billions of people die, we're going to have wars, we're going to have famine. You know, which of these things do you choose using Pascal's wager? Right? It's pretty clear that you make the investments, even if you might be wrong. Because the outcomes are better anyway. Right? So, and if global warming doesn't get us, I think, you know, it's pretty clear to people that, you know, the, the era of cheap oil is over. This is a movie uh, that I hardly recommend to all of you, a documentary about really the, uh, the end of the era of cheap oil called The Crude Awakening. I also really want to point about, out about uh, sort of energy inequality. This is a, a slide from my son-in-law, Saul Griffith, uh, gave a talk at our Emerging Technologies Conference uh, last year or earlier this year, and uh, he, he pointed out that the average American uses the equivalent of, your lifestyle is the equivalent of burning uh, 11,400 watts every, you know, continuously, as if, you know, you, you are in, in the energy you consume in your lifestyle, on average, you're burning, you know, 114 light bulbs at all times, 100 watt light bulbs. Uh, meanwhile, if we divide the world's energy consumption by its population, our fair share, so to speak, is only you know, 200 and, uh, you know, 2300 watts, more or less 2250. And so we're using way more than our share. And as the rest of the world starts to live our kind of lifestyle, we're really going to you know, hit, hit a crunch with you know, cheap oil. And if you believe in global warming, you know, as I do, you're going to have a really serious problem there. So, this is really not going to get better. It's going to get a lot worse. And it's just something just to really bring this home. Uh, Saul did an illustration that that plastic water bottle you have, uh, you know, or, or your vitamin water. If you actually look at the embodied energy in that plastic bottle and drinking that, and you had your fair share of the world's energy, that one bottle is almost 5% of your average daily allowance of energy. Yeah, I haven't drunk from a plastic bottle since. Right? And, and it's, it's, it's really sobering. You know, we have some real problems to solve, and we have also some great opportunities. So when you look at disasters, this picture from the hurricane night, uh, you know, you look at things like, uh, you know, our high school dropout rate, you know, the fact that, you know, America is losing its edge in science, and we're becoming an anti-science culture. Uh, you know, we look at our dysfunctional Congress, we look at the healthcare system. You know, you know there's something I saw the other day, really shocking when I tweeted this, do you realize that there are more slaves in the world today than there have ever been in human history? There's something like 27 million people living in slavery in the world today. Right? God, you know, this is really terrible. And we might ask ourselves, how can I make any difference? 
You know, how can I as a person make any difference? And there's a great bit of wisdom from a book called Struggle for Survival by L.A. Janeway. Uh, this is a history of sort of the industrialization of America during World War II. And he said, the victory small enough to be organized is too small to be decisive. They had to get everybody involved. And I think the scope of the world's problems are such that we do have to get everybody involved. And so you look at World War II, you know, sort of like grow your victory garden, people growing food in their backyards. You know, women entered the workforce for the first time. You may remember Mrs. Rosie the Riveter, you know, symbol of women doing industrial jobs while the men were off at war. You know, contrast that with, you know, the so-called war on terror. We were asked to do nothing, right? This was a mobilization of America, and it created enormous wealth. And I think some of the problems we face are our best opportunity. So, you know, things you can do individually. Nat Tarkington uh, described at OSCON uh, how, when he went back to New Zealand, he started volunteering to teach programming in the schools. You guys also could volunteer to teach programming in the schools. Uh, there's a lot of great nonprofits. This is one called Instead, which is a, a great Web 2.0 story. You know, rare diseases are actually stopped not by, uh, you know, infectious diseases are stopped not by uh, vaccination, really, but by isolation and early detection. And Instead is using collective intelligence to actually early detect things like SARS or bird flu and the outbreaks so they can be contained before they spread. Fantastic Web 2.0 application. It's a nonprofit, though. Here's another one, Usahidi, uh, which is a, uh, an open source project started in Africa where people can use, uh, uh, you know, coordinate disaster response uh, using, uh, you know, mobile phones and the like and, and the web. Uh, you know, open source project uh, for building better prosthetics. You know, Witness, a fabulous uh, project where they're trying to use YouTube-like functionality to deal with human rights abuses. Uh, here's a great story. James Buck uh, you know, was a human rights activist and journalist following activist in Egypt. Uh, and uh, he managed to save his life. Well, maybe, you know, maybe he would have survived anyway, but he twittered the one word, arrested. And uh, of course, that got the word out. And he was, of course, a lot of people uh, you know, came, got, came and uh, made a big stink about it. He got out. Um, but, you know, nonprofits are great. But I really do think that. Great challenges are also great opportunities. And give you another example from you know the, the sort of the you know, post-war era. I always loved the idea of the Berlin Airlift. It was it was one of the most astonishing things, uh, you know, I think in history. You guys may remember after the World War II, Berlin was surrounded. Uh, the Soviets wanted to have the capital. The West uh, wanted to, to keep it out of their hands. And so there was a blockade of any land supplies. And they decided to supply it by air. And for 15 months, you know, there was one flight landing every two and a half minutes. At the peak, there was one flight landing every minute, 24 hours a day. Can you imagine that? And they, they recruited the people to help unload. So they, they actually, at their peak, they were unloading 10 tons in 10 minutes, right? Um, it was volunteers. But what's really interesting, in the course of that airlift, they developed the techniques of modern air traffic control, right? which led to the air traffic. Now, now, I'll leave out the fact how, how it's gone south since then. It was a great achievement at the time. We also saw you know, the whole development of, of cargo aircraft, which didn't really exist up to that point, you know, which helped build you know, the, the companies like Lockheed and Boeing. And of course, it set the ground for things we take for granted today, like Federal Express. So big challenges actually uh, you know, create opportunity. And so, thinking about business and these opportunities, I want to point to a couple of, of great examples of, of things that are hybrid, non-profit, for-profit. It's a company called Benetech, which actually funds uh, non-profits that are actually acting as businesses. They try to make money. Sometimes they even turn successful enough that they sell them and pile the results back into the, the, the non-profits. They, they're always looking for people, right? Uh, the Omidyar Network, Pierre, after he sold eBay, started out trying to be a philanthropist, give away money. He realized that sometimes the best way to make positive change was to invest in companies. So the Vineyard Network is this funny mix of funding nonprofits and funding for-profit companies. They just care. They want to create value in the world. Google, with Google.org, is actually investing their own profits. They set aside part of their value to try to drive useful, interesting projects. And so we saw this, for example, recently an announcement yesterday, I think, about a clean energy partnership between General Electric and Google, where they're trying to figure out how can they work together on a bunch of, of clean energy initiatives. 
There's also great startups in this space. ME, a company in, in the UK that's trying to figure out how do you make an open source framework for carbon trading and carbon sure. tracking. Uh, by the way, I think the whole carbon market thing could be huge if we, we, we coordinate our response to it. Uh, you know, uh, there was an energy camp here at, uh, at, at the show on Tuesday. Uh, I know James Governor Monk Chips also gave a talk about uh, sort of electricity as sort of the next internet. Um, you know, the focus here is on, on how we in IT save, save energy. Right? There's, there's great stuff in, in, the, in the healthcare, quick therapeutics, how do you use mobile phones for uh, doing uh, telemedicine in, in, in other countries. This is a non-profit, I mean, this is not a non-profit, it's a for-profit business. Prosper, peer-to-peer -peer lending. lending. Um, you know, patients like me, social network for people with, with uh, diseases. Uh, you know, even 23andMe uh, looks like a rich man's toy. You know, give your gene sequence. You know, price is now only $400, right? But what these people are really trying to do is build a big pool of genetic data that will allow people to do further research. They're actually trying to harness the consumer internet uh, to do something that has world-changing possibility. And so, I kind of want to remind you, as you think about startups, remember that visionary companies are not afraid to make bold commitments to big, hairy, audacious goals. That's what Jim Collins and Jerry Porras said in the book, Built to Last, a book about great companies. So, just you guys have probably seen this floating around the net. That's Microsoft when it started. Bunch of kids with a crazy idea. You know? We are living, we've all grown up in the world that that group of people created. Right? You know, people are, like to bash Microsoft, but they were visionaries. They had this idea that this PC was going to be on every desk and in every home. And it didn't have to be that way. They made it happen. And meanwhile, the titans of industry at the time were saying, the PC is just a toy. Or take more recently, 1998, everybody said, ah, you know, search, no money to be made there. Right? And these guys said, no, we're going to organize all the world's information. And of course, now we're living, in many ways, in the world that Google built. So I just really want to urge you to think about the potential in big problems. You know, it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Right? Do you really think we're done yet solving big problems? I think Web Meets World is a challenge to all of us. It's a challenge for us to take up, to build companies that matter, to build technology that makes the world a better place, that creates value for all of us. It's not just about figuring out, as I said, how to dip into the great money river of venture capital. Because the fact is, you know, if you have a just sort of a so-so V2 -so idea, it's probably not going to get funded. If you've been funded, you're probably not going to get a second round. Right? So you better be working on something that you think can make a real, real difference. I know entrepreneurs who mortgage their houses because they believe so much in their idea. And they want to make a difference. So I also want to just put in a, a plug for kind of an idea that I think has been really meaningful for me in my own life. We don't always win. And there's a great poem by Brendan Mary Rilke about Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's an Old Testament story. And I'm just going to read a little bit of, uh, of this poem to you. Uh, it's called The Man Watching. He says, I can tell by the way the trees beat after so many dull days on my worried window panes that a storm is coming. The storm, the shifter of shapes, drives on across the woods and across time. And the world looks as if it had no age. The landscape, like a, a line in the psalm book, is seriousness and weight and eternity. What we choose to fight is so tiny. What fights us is so great. When we win, it's with small things, and the triumph itself makes us small. What is extraordinary and eternal does not want to be bent by us. I mean, the angel who appeared to the wrestlers of the Old Testament. When the rest of sinews grew long like metal strings, he felt them under his fingers like chords of deep music. Whoever was beaten by this angel went away proud and strengthened and great from that harsh hand that needed him as if to change his shape. Winning does not tempt that man. This is how he grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. 
We are all going to be defeated in this life. Let's fight with things that matter, that make us stronger, that make us better. That's the challenge. And that's how we're actually going to you know, live up to the promise of this web meets world. We're going to figure out how to make a better world using the power of the web. Great opportunity.